Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Bullpen Theater here at the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Also, welcome to those of you joining us on Facebook Live as we continue our 2022 author series. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Bruce Markison. I work in the Hall of Fame's Education Department. And today it'll be my pleasure to interview Kostya Kennedy. Kostya is the author of a new book, True, The Four Seasons of Jackie Robinson. Uh, just out in April of this year. It uh, has really drawn rave reviews. Kostya has previously written books on Pete Rose, Joe DiMaggio. Uh, he has also written for Sports Illustrated, the New York Times, The New Yorker, among other locations. Please join me in welcoming Kostya Kennedy to the Hall of Fame. Kasia, we, we've talked before, but I'm going I'm to try to mix in some different questions from the last time we did an interview. Getting ready for you. I always like to begin with uh, the titles of books. Uh, sometimes the author's involved, often it's the publisher that decides. This book, True, The Four Seasons of Jackie Robinson, what's the significance of true? Who came up with that? Was that your idea? What does it mean? So yes, it came from, uh, it was a, it's my idea, I actually came up with, with my wife, uh, who was very instrumental, we were talking about it. Um, it did, uh, we, so the working title had been The Four Seasons of Jackie Robinson, and it was partly through discussion with the publisher, was, hey, maybe it, it could use something to sort of unify it and tie it together. Uh, as a little sort of epigraph at the beginning of the book, which says that through all of his time, uh, Robinson was true to the mission, true to the effort, and he was true to his convictions and also true to his own contradictions. Um, and that, that was something that sort of emerged for me. Sometimes people say, what did you learn about Robinson? And not to get ahead of it, but it ties in with this. How consistent and persistent he was in his efforts, in his commitment to what he was doing. Uh, true really became uh, very extremely fitting. And as I go back and look at the book, um, it's almost as if it was there all along, even though it came yeah. a little late later in the process. How do you research a topic like Jackie Robinson? Because he has been featured in many other books. Sure. A lot has been written about him. How did you approach your research in terms of bringing a new angle? Well, so uh, again, the, the subtitle being The Four Seasons of Jackie Robinson, and, and there. Three of those are baseball seasons, so one is 1946 when he's in the minor leagues, um, and two with the Dodgers, and then uh, 1972 where he's no longer in, in the game, and it's the last year of his life. Um, and those are also, metaphorically, it's the spring, summer, autumn, and winter of Jackie's public and athletic life. And by focusing on those years, it sort of enabled me to um, get a little deeper into him as a person and get into the environment around him. I wasn't particularly interested in doing a cradle to grave biography. As you mentioned, there's been some that have been done and some very good ones. Uh, but this is a way to sort of look at somebody a little bit under a microscope. When I did mm -hmm. say that my Joe DiMaggio book, which is called 56, it uh, essentially looked at DiMaggio within the context of America and, and the environment in 1941 during his 56-game yeah. hitting streak. So to look at, at Robinson in this way also just enabled me to sort of focus my attention on some areas of his life which I felt had been quite underreported and which I knew I had some, some sort of special uh, access or angle to. Who did you talk to? Oh, well, I spoke to a lot of people. This book began uh, I had, as, as you referenced, I've been working with work for a long time in Sports Illustrated, and I'd always had sort of an interest in Jackie Robinson, and I'd written a little bit about him here and there, and a uh, movie came out. And then I did a story on Rachel Robinson, uh, Jackie's widow, who's about to turn 100 years old and is still with us. Um, and this was about eight years ago. Uh, and I spent a lot of time with Rachel, uh, and it was during that time that began making made me see that there was a book here, and so I spoke to her indispensably, uh, and also their children, Sharon and David. This is over the course of, of years, um, sort of gathering strength for the book. Uh, when it came time to sort of drill down and reporting on the book, certainly um, ex-players, um, Carl Erskine was wonderful to speak with, Bob Esperanti, who was a rookie uh, during Robinson's last year in 1956, which is the autumn season mm -hmm. of the four seasons. Um, and I spoke to, to uh, 
They ordinary, but people outside the game, um, but certainly people in, in close to civil rights, uh, including a, a gentleman named Ira Glasser, who's the name rings the bell. He was the uh, head of the ACLU in, for the American Civil Rights Union for 25 years, um, and he grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, he was nine years old in 1949, watching Jackie Robinson, um, going to Ebbets Field, which was one of the very few integrated places in America in 1949, anywhere. Right? You'd have, even compared to, you know, they would go through life in Brooklyn, which of course was not segregated legally, but you lived in a, you know, a, a, a Jewish neighborhood or an Italian neighborhood or an Irish neighborhood or uh, wherever you might live, and, and they'd go through their whole life, and their whole daily life, and not see um, a person of, of very different ethnicity on their way to school and the food yeah. or anything, but at this field they did. So speaking to somebody like Ira and other people who were around in those days were uh, was very, you know, very enlightening. Also in Montreal, there were some people from the African American, African Canadian community in Montreal who remembered seeing him in 1946 uh, when he played there. And it was a huge deal. Uh, Montreal Royals was a top farm team of the Dodgers, and you know they they bring out 15,000 fans to the game. It wasn't you know, it wasn't backwater at all, it was a, a big event. And uh, so there are a lot of different people who I had a chance to, to engage with. Yeah. Did you mention Fred Clare was helpful to yes. you? Uh, oh, yes. A long time executive with the Dodgers, uh, was their PR man and became their general manager. Um, we've had Fred on one of our uh, Zoom programs, uh, I want to say it was about a year ago, uh, but he really helped you out a lot. Yeah, he really did. And again, it, because I was sort of focused in my reporting, that was that was key to get to some people. So Fred Clare had been with the Dodgers in 1972, which is the winter season, um, and had met Jackie on two really key occasions. One at an Old Timers Day at um, at Los Angeles, which was Robinson's first time back in the major league ballpark essentially since he retired. Um, after 56 seasons, and was not in baseball in any sense. Um, the closest he really came was his induction ceremony right here in 1962. Um, other than that, was not in baseball. But he, in 1972, he came back and did this event at Dodger uh, Stadium. Fred Clear was at. Uh, Fred was also at the World Series um, that year in 1972. Uh, so he gave me a lot of uh, good detail and some background on, on his experience with Jackie. One of the real challenges is just the passage of time. Jackie passed away 50 years ago. There just aren't that many people around from when he played or even in his post-playing days. Fred Clare is, is, is one of the people that has that connection to 72 and the Dodgers. Uh, you mentioned earlier Carl Erskine. What were some of the insights Carl Erskine gave you into Jackie? Carl, uh, I'll give you one broad and one specific. Um, he made a Robinson one of the close, uh, very close with, with Jackie. Um, he, he was one of the first ones to really just talk to me about how just the, the focus and the intensity that Robinson had every day. He didn't always necessarily think he was having a good time um, when he came out. Uh, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't necessarily the you know, the life of the party or joking around. Or he came to win. Uh, he wanted to win the game, but he was also very aware of, of all the eyes that were on him. Um, Carl first met Robinson the year before when Erskine was uh, pitching for, for the minor leagues. He, he faced the Dodgers in some kind of an intra squad game uh, and pitched pretty well, I guess. And yeah. Robinson came over and shook his hand and said, We're going to be seeing you up in the big leagues and gave him that support. Um, another thing that Erskine told me, which is one of the most vivid um, images, uh, we, we were talking about Robinson just being in a rundown. And as, as we all know, you know, being in a rundown is, is not a particularly exciting play in baseball. It happens, and you watch the ball go back and forth, and then the guy gets tagged, and that's it. There's the out. Yeah. With Jackie, it was a different thing. Party on. Uh, Jackie's in a rundown. And they would all get to the top of the dugout and start to watch what Jackie's going to do because he can move so well. Not, not only just the speed, he was certainly very raw speed, but agile and, and, and he had a you know, football background, could do uh, 
geek around people. And Erskine would say, you know, we come up there and I felt like I was watching a 12-year-old playing with 8-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And it was such a vivid thing, if you think about kids at that age, the difference that um, that, that makes. Um, so again, he was wonderful to speak with um, on, on any level. It's probably one of the few areas where you don't have statistics on. Rundowns and the number of times escape from rundown. Right. Maybe they do it now, but they, they certainly didn't do it back in Jackie's time. Yeah. So let's break down each of these four seasons that you highlight in the book. We'll start with 46, which you mentioned. That's his long season in the minor leagues. He's with the Montreal Royals. He ends up having a terrific season. In retrospect, do you think he needed that year in Montreal, or could the Dodgers have brought him up and expected him to still be successful right away? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting, um, and, and I think there is no question that that year was crucial to them, and I sort of came to that year um, through my early talks with Rachel. She was bringing up a couple of times about how important that was to them. So Robinson had been known as an athlete. He played at UCLA. He, he had some notoriety. But now what he was doing was something of an altogether different category, being the, the one black player in an all-white league which is what it was in 1946 for Montreal Royals. For a brief period of time, he had uh, one black teammate and another black teammate. But for most of the year, even then, it was just the one other person. And then for most of the year, he was alone in an all-white league. And they lived together, he and Rachel, newly married, in a French-speaking neighborhood. Again, uh, Caucasian, no warmly a Caucasian neighborhood. And he was Jackie Robinson, the figure for the first time in his life, getting noticed everywhere, dealing with the celebrities, dealing when they when they would travel out of Montreal. Most of the games uh, were played in the United States. There was one other team in, in Toronto, um, and facing some of the racism and hostility that he would then face in Brooklyn. Uh, it was extremely important for them as a year to get their feet wet. It was also very important for him as a ball player. Uh, he was a great, great athlete, played baseball, football, basketball, and ran track in college. He didn't play all that much baseball, and then he only played about 45 games for the Kansas City Monarchs. So he was still a pretty raw player. Uh, and when he came he came up in, in playing, although he was a little bit older, uh, 27, in, in 1946, uh, some of the stories were told about how he throwed a wrong base, or he uh, missed the cutoff man, or he'd make mistakes. He made kind of basic mistakes. He could be pitched to a little more easily. If a veteran pitcher out there could kind of work him in account a little bit. He still did very, very well, but he was a learning ball player, so it was a crucial year. The last thing I will say on that, though, is that that year, for fans of, of the Dodgers or people who remember baseball history, 46, um, the Dodgers missed the pennant by one game. Um, and they, the, the Cardinals end up winning the National League pennant and playing the Red Sox in the World Series. <coughs> At the end of that season, there were, there were some climbers to bring Robinson up. He was hitting about 350 in the in the International League, which was a very strong league. It was the, the top minor league. Played with Yogi Berry, played with all, all number of uh, Yogi, of course, was in the Yankee system, but all other big stars, lots of other players around him. And the, the um, Dodgers had guys like Eddie Mixis or Ed Stevens in their lineup going down the stretch, guys who are not formidable offensive players, sort of journeyman players. Um, and if they had had Robinson for that last month, month and a half, would they have been one game better? Almost certainly, yes. Right? I mean, who can say for sure? But And if they'd been one game better, they win the pennant in 1946. Maybe they win the World Series yeah. in 2026. It changes the whole complexion of what we think of as the sort of wait till next year Dodgers sure. in the 40s and 50s if they made that decision. That's not to say they should have brought him up. I think Brian Tricky was very, <coughs> the manager of the Dodgers was very clear that he was going to wait, did not want to bring him up in the middle of a pennant race um, when, if he goes over four and makes an error in the Dodgers. Um, lose and now the one black player in the league has cost them a game or he gets into a slump. It was way too big of a risk. So um, they clearly made the right move. And when people question, I say it's sort of like when people say, um, well, they should have let George Harrison write some more songs for the Beatles. Like, well, things kind of worked out. All right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and things kind of worked out for the Dodgers, too. 
One other thing along those lines, Robinson was so versatile. You could plug him in anywhere. Yeah. He could play all four infield positions. He could play the outfield corners. So wherever you needed to help, he pretty much could satisfy that need, too. Yeah. Uh, he, he didn't play outfield until a little bit later in his career. I'm sure he would have had the skill to. But to your point, he had uh, was primarily a second baseman, had been primarily a shortstop, taking ground. Then he came up with the Dodgers at first base, yeah. all along taking ground in the third. So to your point, you could have put him in any number of places. Let's go back to Jackie and Rachel living in Montreal. Was it their own apartment? Did they live with other folks? How did that work? It was sort of a similar to Brooklyn Brownstone. It's still there. There's a plaque on it. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a sort of bilateral apartment, and there was another family uh, above them. Uh, and it was, it was. Uh, of course, he went in off the street, but then in the back there was a terrace on which a lot of people would sort of come out onto the terrace uh, in the evenings and smoke a cigarette or whatever they would do and talk to one another out there. Um, it, again, it was primarily French, um, and neither Rachel nor Jackie ever really learned much French at all. So they didn't, they lacked some of the intimacy with their neighbors, uh, but they were close with them. And when they left, uh, Jackie Jr. was born just shortly after they left in November of, of 1946. And uh, Robinson sent a telegram back to his neighbor in, um, in, in Montreal to say that the baby had been born. They were, the women, it was, it was just post-World War II, so there was still rationing uh, for sugar and meat and other things. And when they found out Rachel was pregnant, they brought her some extra rations and they wanted to support her, especially because Robinson would be on the road a good portion of time with the team and, and Rachel was along. So generally speaking, Rachel and Jackie were treated well. Very much well. well. Extremely well. Yeah. But, yep. And they always said how how much they appreciated it. You know, it's, it's interesting because we, we think of the adversity that Robinson faced, and a lot of that, of course, is from the, you know, the, the people who resisted what he was doing and were against him. I certainly saw it in Louisville that year that he played in the, in the World Series. But it also took a lot of pressure even for the people who were rooting for him. Yeah. You know, he came up and the papers were right. When he was still in the minor leagues uh, in 1946, he came up his first game playing the Jersey City Giants, and the African American uh, newspaper were writing that, you know, the, the hopes and fortunes of all our people are riding on his back. You mm -hmm. know, and so even the people who were rooting for him more than anything, that's a lot to carry. Yeah. You know, um, so he was treated very well. That's not to say he didn't sometimes feel a lot of pressure. Um, even even in a, in an accommodating good society, but how he, how he felt there, I think, unquestionably made it a little easier for him yeah. when he came to the major leagues. What happened in Louisville? So that was the site of the Louis World Series, or Little League, sorry, International League World Series. Um, it was called the Little World Series. That's what right. I was going to say. Um, uh, that year, at the end of that season, and they played the Louisville Colonels. Um, and when they went down to play, this was old Jim Crow. Stands um, segregated, uh, and they really rode uh, Robinson. He had even he, he said it was even worse than when he was in spring training with the Dodgers that year. Um, and uh, Rachel was very upset by it. It was, a, it was a difficult time when they came back to Montreal. And, and I should say, Jackie, there were three games in Louisville, and Jackie did not play well in those games. Mm -hmm. He only got one hit. When they came back to Montreal, the fans of Montreal had read about this treatment. He's gotten. And they're pretty good fans. They're sort of like St. Louis fans these days. I don't know if anybody's here. They don't really boo the opposition, you know. They might not yeah. cheer so loud for you, but they're they're good hosts. That's how Montreal was. Not this time. Every time somebody came off the Louisville, they were booing and cheering because they wouldn't want to stick up for Robinson. And Jackie said how much that meant to him. He yeah. felt like they had embraced him um, as part of their community and family. You know, and he was part of it. He went to a, a black church. Uh, on Sundays when he was home, he and Rachel would go, and I got to speak with um, people who were in that church with him in, in those days, and what it was like for him to come in um, and the march he made. So he was very present in the in the community of Montreal. Yeah. How did his teammates in general treat him? In general, they treated him well. Um, they, and, and they treated him well because, well, they are all, they're all varying opinions, um, but you he was so good, and he made you win, and you could not not respect his effort. Yeah. Um, even Clay Hopper, who was the manager who famously uh, disparaged 
Robinson and Farage all last week well, in the, in the uh, spring training. And we talked about this with Frank Ricky. He didn't want to manage Robinson. Um, but spending a few days with Jackie Robinson, and you see the, the effort that he gave, um, the way he treated the game, the way he treated the people around him. Plus, he had that incredible talent, but just in that work ethic and the way he would respond, you know, if, if he got hit by a pitch, which he did quite a bit, he when he got up went to first, and next time up he had a triple off him. Yeah. And this, this is what made, made you know, turn some of his teammates around and sometimes look at things in a very clear way. This guy going to help me win? What's this guy going to do? And um, so he had a lot of support on his team. He was so good if you're one of the other players and you go to management complaining about him, you look like an idiot. Yeah. Okay. I mean, this. You know, they, they, it was in Montreal, sorry, it was while he was playing with Montreal, but in Jersey City, that first game where I was mentioning all my hopes riding on him, he had a huge game. Uh, I think he had three or four hits. He had a, hits, he had a home run. He uh, danced off third base the way he would. Mobbed afterwards, helped him win. After his home run, George Shuba, and this is a famous picture, who was a white player, shotgun Shuba, who yeah. went on to play with um, Brooklyn. Robinson comes around, and Shuba just comes forward and shakes his hand. And this picture of a white man shaking a black man's hand at home plate became very significant. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, George Shuba totally embraced it, and he had a picture of that hanging on his wall in Ohio until he died. I um, was very proud of it. But he also said, I just accused my teammate. We're together. I just shook his hand, right? Like it was just self-evident. That's what you do. So it, it removes some barriers. Um, and, and Robinson talked about how that day, all the Northerners and Southerners on his team alike came to embrace him, and it was kind of a different, a different mood after that opening day than maybe it had been before. Let's move on to the second season that you highlight in the book, 1949. The numbers are incredible. He bats 342. He slugs 524, drives in 124 runs, steals 37 bases, ends up winning the MVP. Obviously, his talent was there, but how much do you think the outstanding season that he had was a product of just being more comfortable? It's now his third season. He's more accepted. Things are, from a racial perspective, getting at least a little bit better. How much of a factor is that? So it's, uh, I think... No question it was a factor. Um, when, when Robinson came in his first two seasons, he was a very good player. Of course, he won Rookie of the Year as a, as a rookie, and he had another very strong season. His better than 290, a very solid second season. In those years, and, and this is for people who've seen the movie 42 and know Jackie's story, it was uh, he agreed to sort of turn the other cheek. He would not fight back when he, again, no player in Major League Baseball was hit with the pitch more than Jackie Robinson mm -hmm. in 1947 and 1948, right? And that was obviously not an accident. Uh, he would be spiked on the base pass. He would, uh, you know, face all kinds of verbal uh, yeah. attacks from, from opposing fans and opposing players. And he agreed he would turn the other cheek. Um, before the 1949 season, he said, I'm not doing it anymore. Um, and he went to Branch Ritchie and he said, I can't, I can't just take it. And he said to the reporters in spring training, they better be rough on me because I'm going to be rough on them. Mm -hmm. And Robinson was a player who, in the Negro Leagues, when he played for Kansas City, was known for being, quote, uh, one of his a fellow Renfro teammates said, he was up to his neck in every game, meaning he was feisty, he was involved, and it was sort of let loose. Um, you know, Rachel described it as a freer style of play, which is kind yeah. of putting it mildly. In 1949, he was, became that aggressive, aggressive player who played at this high Hall of Fame level for about five seasons after that. And that was a, he was the best player alive that year. He was a, by today's metrics, he had the highest war, you know, better than usual. Mm -hmm. um, he, that year he had, uh, as you mentioned, he better than 340, stole more than 35 bases, and had more than 65 extra base hits. Nobody has done that since. Right? That, that's 75 yeah. years ago. Nobody, Willie Mays didn't do that. Mike Trout, whoever you want to pick, right? No, nobody has, has done that. So he was, um, he came into his own. And, you know, in terms of, you're right, there was, there were more uh, black players in the league to some degree, right? So he had Campanella on his team, John Lucan on his team, Larry Doby had come on uh, in Cleveland and the American League and Satchel Page, and there were a few others. But it was not until 1949, so right before the All-Star game, um, when the, the 
Giants brought up Monty Irvin and Hank Thompson, that Robinson played a major league game against another when his opponent was a black player. So it took two and a half years for that to happen. Um, so it wasn't as he was still he wasn't the only one, but he was still in a, very much in a fishbowl. Um, and that year, of course, the, was the 1949. Another reason why it was an interesting year to look at. The All-Star Game was at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, and Robinson, as well as his teammates, uh, Campanella and um, Newcomb, um, and, and Dobie from the American League, were the first black players to play in an All-Star Game. So again, he was breaking ground there. Um, and that was a big, a big event. What's your sense that in 49, were players on other teams starting to back off because they realize he is going to fight back now? I think to some degree, although, you know, they never really backed off. Um, and it wasn't entirely, it wasn't necessarily, I should say, always racial. It was also that he, he was an antagonizer. You know, white, black, any color, he was tough to play against. Um, he, he came in hard. He would holler at you. He, you know, so he, he continued to get it um, throughout his career. He still, he still, you know, got, got in the ear pool, so to speak. Yeah, that's interesting. He had, uh, I guess, a little bit of um, a Ty Cobb in, in terms of yeah. um, not being a derby player, but being very aggressive and uh, willing to make contact with other players on the team. On no, the team. no question. They, they, they talked to... Uh, Ricky brought up the comparison to Ty Cobb um, in, in 49, and, and people agreed. We, we, certainly from a base running standpoint, so it all is so long ago, but Ty Cobb's been out of the league for a quarter century, and they hadn't seen a base runner like, um, like Robinson since yeah. Cobb was around. I'm trying to remember, was he primarily a second baseman in 49? In 49, uh, I think. Yes, he was, because yeah. I think Hodges is now back at the Lord That's right, back. yeah. Hodges is the first. And that just makes his offensive oh. numbers, especially the power numbers, yeah. jump out even more. Absolutely. I mean, he's doing things that Joe Morgan would do uh, 30 years later. Yep. All right, let's 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 move to the next season we want to talk about, and that's 1956, which turns out to be his final season in the major leagues. Did you think he had a sense going in, this is probably the final go-around, he's, he's putting some weight on, his health is maybe not as good as it's been. Do you think he kind of felt, yeah, this is probably it for me? Yeah, I kind of do, Bruce. I, I think, you know, he, he sort of whispered about it for a couple of years. 1955, the year before, which is obviously a historic year for the for the Brooklyn Dodgers, the one year they beat the, the Yankees in the, in the World Series, um, was, a, was a particularly difficult year for Robinson. He, he didn't play as much. He had injuries. In fact, in Game 7 of the 55 World Series, Robinson wasn't even on the field. They didn't, they didn't put him out there for, wow. for, for Johnny Carter winning the game. So, uh, and he had some difficulty with um, the manager, Walt Alston, uh, and management in general. Um, and in 56, with so he, soon after his retirement, he, he uh, was diagnosed with diabetes. Uh, and it's almost certain that he had some early symptoms of that during his playing career. Uh, he had circulation stuff, he had some leg issues. But in 56, he really rallied. If you go back and look at his, just his raw numbers, nothing like what they were in his peak, but by all measures, a much stronger year, valuable year than he had been in 55. He had a stretch of games in the heat of the pennant race when he was almost back to his old self. Um, he, was, he was heavier, as you said, it became, he, he stole bases less frequently, but much more efficiently. I think he stole only 12 bases, only thrown out three times. Um, and he was, you know, he, he, he sort of had the show of will. He was not going to go gentle. His, the last game, uh, the last hit of his career, so 1956, there was a pretty big game pitched in the World Series that year, Don Larson's perfect game. Um, the, the very next day at Evans Field, the Dodgers and Yankees did nothing and nothing in the, um, in the 10th inning uh, when Jackie Robinson hit the ball over the head of Enos Slaughter. To win the game, mm. one nothing for the Dodgers. The Dodgers win that game, tied the World Series three three, and that's the last hit of Robinson's career. Um, and then, of course, they lost in, in Game Seven. So, uh, it's, it was an interesting year from all those baseball standpoints, and also, as you know, you mentioned, was he thinking it was the end of his career? He certainly was, and he was beginning. He already 
who got a relationship with Dr. King, um, was getting involved in civil rights movements more explicitly, uh, had, had spoken to people in TV and radio where he had already been doing some work for a while about potential jobs afterwards. Um, and soon after the end of that season, he took a job with Chop Full of Nuts as an executive vice president, where, um, just for perspective, he made the same salary that he made as a star player on the Brooklyn Dodgers working uh, in an office for Chop Full of Nuts, but that's what it was in those days. Um, so yeah, he was he was looking forward. I think that you know again the metaphor of it being the autumn uh, of his life and his progression is probably yeah. pretty apt because that's sort of where he was looking for the next stage. You mentioned slaughter, and I hadn't planned on asking about this, but there was an incident supposedly where slaughter spiked him. Slaughter always said it was exaggerated. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean I think it's it's. So it was in 1947, I want to say, that um, Slaughter was coming into first base where um, Robinson was playing first base, and he spiked him pretty hard. Uh, now, Slaughter was a pretty, and, and I should say his nickname was Country, Country Slaughter, and a lot of people felt that it was racial intent and that he went after Jackie. Um, and, and, you know, pretty, pretty vehemently. He always said, no, it's not. I didn't mean to do it. Um, and, you know, I don't know if I have a strong opinion either way. Who's to say what was in somebody's head? He was a tough player. I went, I spent a little time with him as daughter later in his life, yeah. and he would just say, I, I, I want no panty waist. I want no panty waist, he would say. <laughs> he was an aggressive player. And Robinson acknowledged that he didn't like Slaughter. He didn't like that, that incident. He didn't like him in general. Mm -hmm. um, but he did acknowledge that Nina Slaughter played the game hard in the way that he respected. Robinson was very good about that. He was really, he respect he respected the game if, if somebody else respected the game. So, but there was certainly um, I didn't drop his name. I'm glad he picked up on it without some intention. Uh, there's a sort of fitting irony that it, you know that happened the spiking in his first season, early in his first season, 1947. And now it's his last game, and the yeah. last of his career just goes over the glove of Alina Slaughter right. in left field for the Yankees. Yeah. You know, you look back at, at um, that 1956 season, then the aftermath of it. Yeah. He's traded to the New York Giants. Yeah. Why did the Dodgers do that? Why, why did they decide they were going to part ways with him? Of course, he ends up retiring anyway. I always thought that was kind of a strange thing. Any insights on that? Yeah, I think that, so, uh, Walter O'Malley, who was the owner and uh, honcho of the um, of the Dodgers, never fully took to, to Robinson. Uh, Robinson, of course, was brought in by Branch Rickey, um, and Branch Rickey, first of all, Walter O'Malley was very progressive on civil rights. It's not to say that he had any resistance on that front, but he did resist, resist uh, resent a little bit the attention that Branch Rickey got. There mm -hmm. were two guys with big egos, and Branch Rickey, deservedly so, got the attention for putting his neck out, for bringing him in. And O'Malley was like, what about me? So much so, just a quick aside, that um, Dodger Stadium, when they set up, there was no mention of Branch Rickey anywhere. <laughs> there were pictures of, uh, <laughs> pictures of Jackie and Roy Campanella and all the old Dodgers from Brooklyn. They suddenly brought the Brooklyn history with them. Mentioned the country. So, um, and he used to call Robinson a, a Ricky man um, because he had, was tied in with Branch Ricky, and Robinson loved Branch Ricky. He was so sorry when Branch Ricky left the team, was forced out by O'Malley. So there was always a little bit of that under undercurrent, right? But O'Malley was not as as wedded to keeping Robinson and having him as certainly as Branch Ricky would have been as even as Fuzzy Bavese and other people in the front office were more aligned with, with Robinson. Um, and I think that they, you know, they felt that they, Robinson was no longer a star player, but he was certainly a very useful player. He was certainly a player that fans came out to see. Um, and they had been getting interest in Robinson for a while. They sort of dangled him out there that, hey, he, he's somebody who could be had. And when the Dodgers, when the Giants came, um, they, they saw an opportunity to make a deal, and they did. And it, it, it lived as a possibility for long enough that Willie Mays, then a young player for the Giants, wrote kind of a welcome to the team telegram to Robinson. Um, Robinson, at the time of the trade, had already accepted his job with the Chocolate Nuts, but hadn't made it public. He'd agreed he was going to yeah. hold on that information 
that he was retiring and had published it in a Look magazine article. Right. And in the interim, um, was when he was traded. So he never showed up in, in for the Giants, which would have been a, a lot for Dodger fans to take. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it was kind of just, you know, the time had come. Um, and I, I don't think Robinson, we, I, I mentioned earlier that Robinson had been kind of out of baseball and not been, been in, and not been with the Dodgers for a long time. It's partly because of that trade. He, he was never happy mm. that that trade happened. And, and Walter O'Malley's son, Peter O'Malley, um, spoke about that he thought it was an organizational regret. Yeah, it was too bad. That, it was that brings us to the final year of Jackie's life, 1972. And here's a really interesting connection to one of our new inductees coming up, Gil Hodges. Yeah. Gil has the, the heart attack uh, during the strike. Uh, it's down in Florida. They're waiting, hoping that the strike can get settled, and he comes off the golf course. He has a fatal heart attack. Very young guy still, uh, but he'd had a history of heart problems. And it was Gil Hodges' death that indirectly brought Jackie back to baseball. Explain. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So that was in April of 1972. And I will just... Uh, 72 was the year that Robinson died. It was also a very active year for him. He remained extremely active and engaged right mm -hmm. to the end of his life. So this was in April of, uh, I want to say March or April of 72. Um, as you mentioned, Hodges died suddenly at 48. Um, and they came to the funeral. Uh, and Robinson had lost his son, Rachel and Jackie's son, Jackie Jr., the year before. And he... Robinson really had not seen a lot of players. He, he was still somewhat in touch with Franca, who lived kind of near him. But people like Newcomb and Joe Black and any number of other players, he just hadn't seen for a long time. Um, and felt a little vulnerable going there, you know, after the loss of his son and all that. And that's where they saw each other. Um, and a very emotional day. Robinson talked about how much Hodges had meant to him. And it was there that Newcomb Newcomb at that point had a job with the Dodgers. He's one of very few um, former black black former players to actually have a job in baseball, which is one of one of the things that Robinson was upset about. But Newcomb did have this job, and he said, "Hey, what do you think? We're doing an old time mm -hmm. event um, in the summer. Maybe we can get you out there." And that began a conversation uh, with the Dodgers and with baseball as a whole that Robinson had not been having that. Uh, conversation for, for a number of years. So it was through that funeral and the, the emotions, I think, of that day and the closeness of that day that, that led to him coming back into the game. Uh, he was very close to Gil Hodges. Yep. Uh, I think you had said earlier when we were having lunch that uh, that was maybe the worst day of his life. Um, the only day that was worse was when his own son died. Well, he, that's what he said on a television interview that day. Uh, apart from the Death of my son. That's the mm -hmm. worst day, of, worst day of my life. You know, you can imagine Hodges was a uh, strapping, formidable guy at first base, uh, and when things got a little prickly out there um, between Robinson and some of the opponents, Gil was kind of a silent uh, force to keep to keep the peace a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and 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 he, you know, he, he absolutely appreciated what what Hodges was as a. Of course, I just went on to manage the Mets and was, was a leader, but I think even from his early days, people recognized what a leader Gil Hodges was on the field, sort of older than his years in terms of how he comported himself. Um, so that relationship was very important to Jackie's yeah. growth in the league. Later in 72, Jackie is invited to throw out the first pitch at the World Series. How'd that come about? So that also was uh, beginning through here, uh, through the reconnection with the Dodgers. Um, and they say, hey, we should do something else uh, for him. And, and some people reached out, Newcomb and, and a gentleman named Tom Valanti, who was a, uh, worked at BBDO, which is an advertising outfit, um, and worked um, worked close to baseball and was very close to Robinson. And people just put a little uh, lent on, on Bowie Kuhn, uh, but, but we should just be a good time to do it. It was 25 years after uh, Robinson had broken in now, 47 to 72. Um, and they brought him in to sort of honor him for the work he had done with drug rehabilitation centers, which tied into what had happened with Jackie Jr. and his, his son. Um, and it was, it was a you know, really important day, and he was, he was out there. Um, and this is where he gives his sort of almost classic 
Robinson speech. One thing that's interesting about, about Jackie Robinson, he's such a disruptor, obviously, and, but he, I, he was also somebody who pretty much played within the rules, meaning that he, he did things, but he, but he didn't, he did it within the constructs of the game, within the constructs of the situation. He was cordial, and then he'd speak his mind. And this speech on the, um, on the field before game two of the World Series, very much like that. He comes in, he's very gracious. He thanks Bowie King genuinely. And he thanks baseball, and he thanks uh, Pee Wee Reese is on the field with him and some other people. And, and uh, so grateful, and he says how pleased he is, proud and pleased he is to be there. And then, of course, the last line, I'll be even more proud and pleased when I see a black manager um, on the third baseline. That's where managers tended to be in those days at the third baseline. Um, and that was his sort of, you know, I'm going to say it. I'm here. I'm going to I'm gonna rattle the cage. Yeah. Um, and so there he is. And nine days later, he dies. Nine days later at home, um, uh, just you know, seemingly suddenly, although he was certainly in failing health for some time. He wasn't going to let baseball off the hook. Nope. Two years later, it was around, I think, October of 74 that Frank Robinson's finally hired. Yep. So, Do you think yeah. Jackie's words, did, did they have any kind of an impact? I know it's two years later. Uh, I think there's no question they did. You know, yeah. I, I mean, it, certainly there are other people saying it, and there's push, but Jackie Robinson said it. Look, I just said it, say maybe many of you have known or, or know that we still t hear those words today, 50 years later. There's no question that that was said and heard uh, when, when he said it then, and um, and it made a made a, uh, a remark. Joe Morgan comes running over to him as he's leaving, uh, who's the second baseman for the Reds in, in those in those years. And shakes his hand and thanks him for what he had said and for what he had meant to, to Morgan. Um, and you know, I, I can only imagine um, Robinson spent the game sitting next to Billy Keel and he was first pitch. And imagine what else he said. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Although physically he was obviously he was struggling. He was at the end of his life, but mentally seemed to be as sharp as ever. There's no indication that when he died, he was only 53. Yeah. And there's no indication that he was anything but as sharp as ever up until his tragic last day. Um, he he had, was, did not see very well. You know, he was with Rachel on the field there and had to kind of be led off the field. Um, severe circulation issues in his, in his leg. Really failing um, physically, but no, but absolutely, you know, sharp and, and insistent uh, as ever to the end. We do a program through the Education Department on civil rights. It's called Before You Could Say Jackie Robinson. And we talk about Jackie extensively at the end of the program. And invariably, when we take questions from the kids, somebody will ask, you know, when did Jackie die? How old he was? You mentioned 53. And they'll ask, you know, why he died? What, what happened? And whenever I answer, I say, well, medically, he was diabetes. But I think other factors may have been involved, the, the pressure of being the first black player in the 20th century, the abuse that he took. Um, but we can only imagine how much abuse that, that he took both at the ballpark but also in other areas. What's your personal take on that? Do you think um, it was a combination of the medical problems and the yeah. off-the-field baseball issues? Yeah, I mean, I, look, honestly, I, for me, Bruce, I was thinking it's, it's primarily the medical issues. Um, they, were, they were actual real things. He was just the man who didn't smoke or drink. He, he did like like his sweets quite a bit, which isn't a great thing if, if you're a diabetic. Um, his brothers lived to, into the well their 80s. Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem that there was a genetic predisposition. Yeah. But listen, he, he, was, he did go gray even years before that. As you mentioned, he put on some weight early on. There's no question the stress all around of what he went through of continuing to be a figure who basically every move is watched. Um, he, and, and he never shied away from it. Even after the, after the game, uh, you know, he, he had public feuds with Malcolm X, with other, uh, other people in the movement, outside the movement. Uh, he, he write letters to the president if he, if he was, didn't like what was being said. He put himself out there. He put himself in, in situations where there would be a lot of stress on him. And so I'm sure that that did have some impact. It's hard to quantify, but um, I, can, I can only imagine uh, the stress he dealt with. Costa Kennedy has done a wonderful book, True the Four Seasons of Jackie Robinson. Uh, what we're going to do in a few moments is head out into the atrium for a book signing.
but I do want to leave a couple of minutes in case somebody has another question, an area that we have not uh, talked about. Anybody with questions for Kostya? Uh, thought I saw a hand up there. No? Ian, yeah. So why is the book titled True? Well, I think you, you missed the beginning, I okay. think. Gotcha. We did talk a little bit about that, but give, give us a quick summation. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Really, come to, let, me, let me just grab it. Sure. I'll read a little epigraph at the very front, just one sentence. Uh, whatever the context and circumstances, Jackie Robinson remained true. True to the effort and the mission, true to his conviction and to his contradiction. Okay. So it's sort of... Uh, that, that's, uh, it, as, as it came a little bit late, as we were saying early on, uh, the title, but it really does sort of unify his, his direction and the purpose that he had throughout his life, uh, public life. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Did you at all consider looking at other seasons than the ones that you ultimately ended up looking through that those lenses of? Yeah, it's a good question, and, and I can't really say that I, I early on, partly through speaking with... Um, Rachel, I knew the 1946 was going to be one of the years, and I pretty quickly knew that 72. Um, and I think the others kind of came kind of naturally. I don't remember, uh, honestly, whether I, I didn't seriously think about another year. I think at one point I said, oh, maybe 55. But then when I started to look at 56 and see what it meant in Jackie's life, mm -hmm. sort of separated from the Dodgers as a whole, it became that year. So, And, and I wanted the year to be... They're distinct. He's, a, he's the same person, but he's also a different person. And the context around him, one thing I just want to mention was that uh, think about when, when Jackie Robinson broke in, Martin Luther King was an 18 year old student of theology. He had never given a public speech. Nobody had heard of Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. When Jackie retires from baseball in 1956, we are about a year into the Montgomery bus boycott. So that tells you a little bit about what was going on in this country and the context of the way things change, uh, not just in Jackie's life, but in, in the circumstances of the day. And King really respected him for his being older, having the experience. He felt like this is a guy who's got some wisdom to pass along. Oh, no, I mean, Dr. King has said uh, that he doesn't think he would have he would have gained the acceptance he did and risen as quickly, if not for the, the ground laid by Jackie Robinson. Now, that's sort of typically generous of Dr. King to say, so I don't know exactly how to, but there's no question that he was, as, again, as King said, Robinson was a sitter in or before sitting. He was, he was paving a way um, before, obviously the civil rights struggle has been going on since 1619, essentially, right? But in terms of the modern movement, he was right at the forefront of all the stuff that would happen in the 50s. You know, one last thing is, uh, AP, you guys, some of you guys are, are, are probably not that far removed from thinking like U.S. Gov, AP, U.S. Gov, and, 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 and in, the, in the textbook when I was working on it, I looked at it and you look on the civil rights, and the first line is that in 19, the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement, is in 1947, Jackie Robinson began to play baseball. Right. 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 And then they go on to, to everything else, right? It, it, so it, it's a recognition of Given the size of baseball in the country and the events, it's cold out of people's imagination. It was such a huge, huge marker. Kasha, thank you. It's been great. My pleasure, Bruce. Again, thank the book, True, The Four Seasons of Jackie Robinson. Please join us uh, in the atrium. The book is for sale in the bookstore. And I think Kasha's given you a, a pretty good sense uh, that there's a lot of great material in this book, a lot of new material that we were not really aware of before. Uh, so please join us, if you will, in the atrium. Thanks, everybody, for being with us for the author series.